when I was a kid, I was Wonder Woman. I had the invisible plane, I had the lasso of truth, and of course I had the uniform, or as my mom liked to call it, underoos. And I was talking to my friends recently on Facebook about this, and it turns out when they were kids, they were superheroes too. Um, in fact, I bet a lot of people here in the audience used to be superheroes. And it's interesting, because, you know, we weren't pretending to be superheroes. We really believed it. I bet the parents that are in the room right now can attest, your kids mean it when they come to you and they say, I'm Batman. <laughs> They're Batman. So I want to talk today about what it would take for the people here to really believe that they're superheroes again, even though we're now all smart grown-ups that know better. Um, so as John said, I'm a writer, and I write for video games. I uh, come in and I help studios develop their storylines and characters for their titles. And I've been very fortunate to work on some great projects, like Bioshock and Far Cry 2. And I'm... <laughs> There's definitely one gamer here. I've been part of a huge industry. In 2011, gamers spent $24.75 billion with a B on games. This industry is bigger than movies now. And I want to uh, talk to you today about three things. I want to talk first about what I've learned about how to tell stories in games. I want to talk with you about how stories shape how we see ourselves. And then I want to talk about how we could change that story and become the hero of our own lives. And I have nine minutes to do it, so here goes. Uh, so when I was a kid, my father was a journalist. He worked for the CBS Evening News with um, Walter Cronkite. He was a field producer, so he spent a lot of time out in the field covering stories. And that meant he wasn't home very much. In fact, he was sometimes gone three weeks out of the month. And uh, I missed him a lot. He was my dad. He was my hero, I adored him, and I wanted him to be home, and he wasn't. So I did what any lonely kid with an overactive imagination does. I just made him up. I pretended like he was there. And pretend dad was awesome. This guy never punished me. He was totally on my side all the time. He said exactly what I needed to hear when I needed to hear it. In fact, looking back, I can see that as a kid, my closest relationship was with someone who wasn't real. Eventually, of course, I did grow up, I finished school, and it was time for me to get a job. And I knew I wanted to be a writer, and I could not for the life of me figure out how writers got paid to write. I've been doing it for free for years, but I had to pay the bills. So I started looking around, and I found a studio that was making kids' games. In fact, at the moment that I found them, they were making a game for girls. It was a slumber party game. So there were, on the screen, there were four little girl avatars talking the entire time, just like girls do at slumber parties. 20 people applied for this job, but I got it, because I'm a girl, and therefore I'm an expert on slumber parties. <laughs> so this is how my glorious career began. <laughs> so I started out first making games for kids, and then eventually went on to make uh, games, I guess, for bigger kids uh, and grown-ups. Lots of action-packed, exciting, uh, full of explosives, full of action, full of crazy. And it was a great job. In fact, it was the perfect job for me because I had spent my childhood making up characters for myself, like my father. And now I was making up characters for other people. In fact, if you have played some of the games I've worked on, you have played with characters I helped to create. So the next time you're playing a game and you're talking to a space marine or an African warlord or a super spy, you're probably talking to me. <laughs> um, so it was a great job for a while. And then something shifted. I found myself getting frustrated. Something was missing. And I couldn't figure out what it was. And I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I looked around, and I'm, I just couldn't sort it out. And then finally, one day, it hit me. The problem that I was having was not with the world around me. The problem was me. The problem was that the story I was telling myself about who I was and how my life should be didn't match up with the reality that I was living in. Stories really matter. Stories are the filter through which we understand the world. And if we're telling the wrong story to ourselves, it's a recipe for pain and disappointment. And, you know, I had a friend of mine and I was talking with him about it and he's like, you know, it just sounds like you need to start being the hero of your own story. You need to start driving the boat. 
And it really made me stop and, and pause. I'm a professional writer, and somehow I had managed to tell myself the wrong story. Whoops. <laughs> and a lot of it stemmed out of the work I did in video games. So I want to talk with you about that today. I had to take a step back as a writer and really think at a deep level about how stories really work. And I want to share that with you today. So, um, as I said, I write for video games. So let's get one thing out of the way right away. Not all games need stories. Tetris is fine. <laughs> that is a perfect game, no story required. And sometimes when you play a game, frankly, all you really need to hear is go save the princess. You're like, got it, I'm on it, I'm out. But in the modern era, studios are spending up to $100 million to develop a game. And they're creating 40 hours of gameplay and they want you, the gamer, to see every minute of it. And one of the ways that you can get a player through the game is the story. The idea being that they will keep playing to find out what happens next. So the team sits down to create a storyline. And what's one of the first things you need when you're making a story? You need a character. You need a hero with a desire line, right? That's just like basic building block of story. So who's the hero of the game? It's the player. So you sit down, you spend a lot of time blood, sweat, and tears with the team to create a player character with a desire line, and you put it in front of the player, and guess what happens? Yeah, you skip it. You're like, X button, I'm out. No, I'm not gonna watch a cinematic. No, I don't care what you tell me. Half the time, players don't buy into the story. Some do, God love them, but some don't. And the reason is that when people play games, they very rarely play as a character. They play as themselves. Like, for all the gamers here, like when you're talking to your friends about something you were playing last night, you don't say, Master Chief got shot out into space and sucked into a planet, man, it was so cool. No, you say, I was shot out of space and sucked into a planet, which is cool. It happened to you, not Master Chief. You're playing as him, but you're still yourself. Players want to be free. It's one of the best things about games. It's agency. It's the ability to do what you want, when you want, the way you want to do it. And what players want to do is play the game. So, this puts us as developers in a pickle. On the one hand, we want to create a great story for you. On the other hand, the players want to be free to do whatever they want. So what's the solution? Well, there's one solution. Uh, what you can do is you can give the player the illusion that he's the hero. But as the team, you give the desire line, which is the engine that drives the story, the thing that somebody wants desperately more than anything in the world. And you give that desire line to one of the characters in the game, a non-player character. And the reason is that the player knows it's a game. He knows it's made up, right? But for all the characters in this game, for them, it's life or death. That video game world is the only world they'll ever know, and the team can totally control those characters. So when those characters say something, they mean it. So, wait a minute. <laughs> You're thinking to yourself, if someone else is the hero, then who am I? Well, think about how players play a game. What do they mean to do when they sit down to play a game? They usually want to beat the game. And when they're in the game, they're going buck wild, right? They're going crazy. They're like touching everything, they're kicking everything. They're like seeing what they can do. They're testing their limits. Uh, a lot of times they're fighting <laughs> every single thing they see and every single person they see. In terms of the behavior of the player, the player is often playing a bad guy a villain and antagonist. And I want to stop for a second and say there is nothing wrong with being the bad guy sometimes. It's a fun role to play. I mean, actors live for bad guy roles, right? Look what Heath Ledger did with the Joker. It's fun, and games are supposed to be fun. There's nothing wrong with it. But it's interesting because you're being told you're the hero, right? When we, when we buy games, they tell us it's all about us. You're pl you think you're playing as the hero, but in fact, you're the villain. So, okay, you're thinking, that's interesting, like, about your industry. It's a little bit of, like, kung fu trickery that we use to, like, slip a story in a game. But what does this have to do with real life? Well, I actually think it has a lot to do with real life. And I'll tell you a story to explain. So I live in San Francisco. I had to fly cross-country to give this talk. And on the way here, there was a little boy in the road behind me, and he was playing a game. It was called Kick My Seat. I was not into this game. <laughs> and it's interesting, right? Because he wasn't doing it to drive me crazy. That was just an added benefit. 
He was doing it because he was bored and he was trying to have some fun. And he was having fun, but by doing that, he was also learning about limits, what he could get away with, how the world around him worked. When we play games, we learn. All kids play for fun, but as they play, they learn, right? That's how we all did it when we were kids. That's how all our kids are doing it right now. Games we make up in our heads and games that are given to us. So, if we are playing a game for 40 hours where we think we're the hero, but we're not, what are we unconsciously, accidentally learning? We're learning how not to be the hero in our own lives. So, the trick is to know that. The trick is to be aware of that, because it doesn't have to be that way. You can be the bad guy in games, and then you can be the hero in real life. You can flip that script. And here's how. And this, by the way, is something I'm struggling with myself. So I'm right there with you, trying to understand this. Like, how can I change my life to be the hero? How can we all do it? One way to start, again, look at your life like you're a writer, and ask yourself the three questions a writer asks to create a character. The first one is, are you ready to figure out what you really want? Because what every story needs is a hero with a desire. And it seems like it's an easy question to answer, but some people go their whole lives without figuring it out. And you've got to be able to say it at least to yourself. You know, I want to be a dancer. I want to be the president of the United States. I want to be the best parent I can be. Whatever you deeply at your core really want, that's where your story starts. And then the second question you can ask yourself is, am I ready to fight for what I want? Because that's something else every story needs. It needs conflict and obstacles. And when you start going after what you want, you are guaranteed going to run into obstacles. In fact, you want them. It's what's going to make you tough, right? And there's going to be obstacles out in the world, but the toughest ones, from personal experience, I have to say, are the ones inside. The ones about self-doubt and shame and fear. When you step into that arena to get what you want, your demons are going to come out with you. And they are going to be ready to rumble. So, game on. And then the third and final question you can ask yourself is, am I ready to risk it all? Because that's something else every story needs. It needs suspense and uncertainty. That's where the drama comes from. And that means that failure has to really be an option. And this is one way that life is different than games. When you sit down to play a game, you will succeed. If you want to beat the game, you will beat it. You might have to die a dozen times and respawn before you get there, but you'll get there. And unfortunately, there's no respawn or restart button for life. You know, there is this great movie that came out several years ago. It's called The World According to Garp. Has anyone here seen it? Yeah. So the story, at one point in the story, one of the older characters dies. And the little boy is sitting there trying to make sense of it all. And his mom comes along. His mom is this very no-nonsense nurse from New England who tells it like it is, even to the five-year-olds. And... The boy says to his mom, Mom, are, am I going to die? Do people die? What is it all about? And here's what she says. You know, everybody dies. My parents died. Your father died. Everybody dies. I'm going to die too. So will you. The thing is to have a life before we die. It can be a real adventure having a life. I love this. I saw the movie when I was 12 and I was like, Yes! <laughs> Sign me up. I think there's something really moving about that. I think there's something that's inside all of us that's a calling. We feel this desire to have a life that's bigger than we think possible, and we want to make it happen, and this is one way to make that happen. So I want to close with a want ed, if anyone's looking for a job. Um, this was actually from the 1920s. A man named Ernest Shackleton was organizing an expedition to Antarctica, and he needed men for a ship. So he put an ad in the paper, and here's what it said. Men wanted for hazardous journey. Small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful. Honor and recognition in case of success. He needed 20 men. Do you know how many applications he got? 5,000. You will probably never see a job listing like that in your lifetime. But you can choose your own adventure, and you can choose to be the hero of your own life. It's up to you. Thank you.